Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, I know that um, we are probably going to have some folks filtering in over the next few minutes, but I don't want to delay our start. Um, very, very delighted that you've joined us uh, this morning for our um, Unlocking College Learning mini conference. Um, I have a couple of little housekeeping items. I just mentioned a minute ago, um, the QR codes that are set up around the room, if you could take a moment to use them, that's a way to check in for the session. It also gets, um, we have a little pre-workshop survey that we're um, having you do that's just a little, some check boxes. We will replace all those QR codes um, at the end of the session for a check out survey. And that will be how we collect your attendance to report it if you are here for a class. Um, I would like to thank Provost Pardue for her encouragement and support for this event and for keeping us caffeinated. She provided the funding for our coffee bar. Please feel free to get up and get yourself an iced coffee. I've been assured by the folks there's pumpkin spice syrup in there now. So mm -hmm. apparently we've made that transition. Um, <clears throat> I would also like to thank um, Lee Kopi and the communications team for um, all of the technical expertise in helping to set up this event. I also want to thank um, Mark Ebenfield and the Center for Excellence in Teaching and Learning. They are uh, our partners for this event and they are presenting a similar program for faculty later in this semester. So in just the same way, you're going to learn about how to engage in learning practice uh, and improve your learning practice. The faculty are gonna do that too. Okay, and then, um, a tremendous thanks to the SASE staff who very um, intrepidly responded to my proposal for this event, and they will be presenting um, the sessions that happen after this one. So our agenda this morning, we will have a keynote workshop that's going to be presented um, by Dr. McGuire via Zoom. I've had the opportunity to attend workshops with Dr. McGuire in the past, and I know from experience that she will keep us on our toes and engage the whole time. So get, get ready for that. Um, after the keynote workshop, we'll have a short break and then you can choose from three options for your second session. Those will be led by SASE staff and they will present application of some of the principles that um, Dr. McGuire is going to be talking about. So in this room, Karen Tasker will be leading a uh, session on applying the study cycle to biology. And that would be applicable whether you're in Bio 104, Bio 105, Marine 105. Um, it's It works for any of those. In, in the SASE, Eric Drown will be presenting active reading for Psych 105. So if you're enrolled in Psych 105 or a course like that, you'll find um, some great applications for active reading in that. And then in room 227, which is right behind the, the tiles there, um, Sarah Ross will be presenting self-regulated learning strategies to supercharge your study practice. All students who participate in the breakout sessions are entered into a raffle drawing for a SASE prize pack that includes copy, a copy of Dr. McGuire's book, Teach Yourself How to Learn. And then lastly, I know that many of you are here today because you've been assigned to be for a class. So in fulfilling that requirement, I do hope that you will be open to what you can take away from this session um, and from the sessions later today so that you can add to your study practice and grow as a student. I hope it will also be just the beginning of your relationship with SASE and we'll see you often. With that, I am honored to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Sandra McGuire. Dr. McGuire is Professor Emerita of Chemistry and Director Emerita of the Center for Academic Success at Louisiana State University. Prior to joining LSU, she was at Cornell University where she received the coveted Clark Distinguished Teaching Award. Her best-selling book, Teach Students How to Learn, was published in 2015, and versions for students and parents have subsequently been published. Dr. McGuire's most recent accolades include being named a 2022, uh, 2022 Louisiana legend by Louisiana Public Broadcasting. She's also been listed in the 2020 edition of Marcus Who's Who in America, has received the 2019 Commitment to Excellence in Academic Support Award, 
from the Commission for Academic Support in Higher Education and was inducted into the LSU College of Science Hall of Distinction in 2017. She's an elected fellow of the American Chemical Society, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and the Council for Learning Assistance and Developmental Education. She received the Presidential Award for Excellence in Science, Mathematics, and Engineering Mentoring in a White House Oval Office ceremony. So thank you and welcome, Dr. McGuire. Thank you so much. Uh, oh, and I'm getting applause even before I start. So thank you. And let me just applaud uh, the students for coming out. I'm really, really pleased uh, to be with you virtually. I wish I could be there in person, um, but it's nice to join you virtually. And I do have to ask because I do a lot of talks uh, with student groups and students have been uh, required to attend. And uh, I'm going to ask a lot of questions during this uh, workshop during our time together. And I need total honesty. You're not going to tell me anything that I have not heard from student groups in the past. And so, and I have actually a pretty good view of the room. So uh, please just raise your hand if you are there because you were required to be there. Please raise your hand if that's the case. Okay, and uh, I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Frazier, uh, please tell me approximately, because I can't really uh, see the um, percentage of people raising their hands. You guys are about the size of gnats uh, on my that screen. That was just about everybody. Oh, that was just about everybody. Okay, mm -hmm. well, uh, hopefully by the end of this, uh, you will be uh, happy that you were required to attend because I think we're going to have fun this morning. And so let me go ahead and share my screen. And I've got share sound on. Let me get the right one up and um, on get the first slide. Okay, let me go back. Okay, so can everybody see my slide? Okay, wonderful. Okay, so what we're going to be talking about today is uh, metacognition. And I say that metacognition is the key to not only acing courses, but life. I use it in my life all the time. But I just want to get a sense of, and now you're much smaller than you were before, since my slide is taking up most of the screen. And so, Dr. Frazier, I'm going to, uh, you're going to have to tell me these percentages that you see. Um, sure. But let me ask, uh, please raise your hand if you would say that you are very familiar with that term metacognition. How many of you would say you're very familiar? Okay, Adam. Nope. That, that would hand. be zero percent. Okay, great. All right, so let's dissect that word then. And uh, you can just yell out uh, these answers as a group. Okay, so metacognition, if we look at that word, would you say, is that a simple word or a compound word? What are they saying? Compound word. Okay, excellent. Compound word. You're absolutely right. And so if it's a compound word, then that means that there's a root word. And in this one, there's a prefix. So what is the root word in metacognition? Just yell that out for me. Cognition. Cognition. Yes. And so my next question is, what comes to mind when you hear that word cognition? And um, this time, Dr. Fraser, you may have to uh, recognize individual students because they'll have different answers. Um, sure. But please share with the group, what comes to your mind when you hear the word cognition? Um, remembering. Okay, remembering, great. Mm -hmm. Any others? Understanding. Understanding, okay, great. And I'll take one more. The mind. The mind. Okay. Yes. And oh, and I gotta have to tell you that I'm gonna ask a lot of questions, and there are no right or wrong answers to the questions that I'm asking. Uh, I just want to know what you're thinking and what your experience has been. And so, yes, remembering the mind. Uh, another way is thinking. And so the definition that I'm going to use, well, I shouldn't say definition, but uh, what I'm going to use as kind of a, an indication of cognition is thinking. And uh, so if we take cognition to mean thinking, when you put the prefix meta onto a word, it just means doing that thing about that thing. And so if we're talking about metacognition, then we're talking about thinking about your own thinking. And so it's kind of as if you had a big brain outside your brain, looking at what your brain is doing. And that big brain 
brain is asking your brain questions and it's saying, does she really understand this information or did she just memorize it last night because the test is today? Uh, if I've got a paper to write, my metacognitive brain is asking me, do you realize you need to start thinking about the topic early? You need to go to the writing center, you need to talk with the instructor, you need to get a draft written soon enough that you can share it with the instructor so you can get feedback on it, so you can improve it so that the one that you turn in, when you turn in the final paper, it's going to be as good as it can possibly be, or are you planning to just whip it out uh, the night before like you did in high school? So it's really your ability to kind of analyze your thinking and think about your own thinking. And so we're going to talk about that as the key to acing courses and life. And so I want to start by telling you a story. This is a true story. Uh, it happened at a dinner party in Germany back in the 1930s. And there was a Swiss aerodynamic scientist at this dinner party. And he got bored with what was going on. And so he started thinking about things that fly since he's an aerodynamic scientist. And uh, he started thinking about bumblebees. And he was thinking, why should bumblebees be able to fly? Because they've got this huge body. They've got relatively short wings. And they just don't seem to have enough wing power to stay in the air. They're not, they don't have long, sleek bodies with long wings like a wasp. And here's the uh, bumblebee from another vantage point. And you can really see this huge body and these teeny tiny wings. And um, so he started doing some calculations on his neck and looking at the relative size of the body and the wings. And the calculations kept telling him that there's no way bumblebees should be able to fly. And he did the calculations over and over, got the same result. Bumblebees should not be able to fly. But the good news is bumblebees do not know any aerodynamic science. And so they don't know they're not supposed to be able to fly. And so they just keep right on flying, no matter what those calculations said. And so I like to tell this story to students because I'd like you to be aware of the things that you are likely to face as you climb the academic ladder. Oh, here's another question for the group. I'm just curious, how many students in attendance are first year students? Raise your hand if you're a first year student. That would be almost everybody. Oh, okay. Um, any sophomores present? Yeah, a couple. Okay, juniors? No. No one? One, oh, yeah. one, one. Okay. Seniors? No. Okay. Got you. All right. And so, yeah, so <laughs> most of us are very early in, in our academic career. And so as you climb the academic ladder, you're likely to uh, encounter people whose miscalculations are going to tell them that you shouldn't be able to succeed. And so what I want you to do is think back, go all the way back to elementary school and raise your hand if you've ever encountered someone who, when you told them something that you were planning to do or something that you were interested in, uh, they gave you the impression that they really didn't think you were going to be successful. If that's ever happened to you, raise your hand. Okay. That's quite a few. Okay, I, I see quite a few. And it's great if you haven't encountered that, but recognize that you possibly will. But just like the bumblebee, you don't have to pay any attention to those people because you know that you'll be able to be successful. But I do want you to expect obstacles. Uh, I want you to expect that things are going to uh, pop up that you didn't expect, things that seem that they're going to knock you off your game. But and, and they look like stumbling blocks, but I want you to remember that stumbling blocks and stepping stones look identical and you get to determine what role they're going to play. And so let me just ask, uh, if, again, if you go back to, I'll say, high school uh, or before, have raise your hand if you've ever encountered something that, you know, you thought you were moving right along, doing well, and then all of a sudden this obstacle or this unexpected thing popped up that seemed like it was going to derail your continued progress. Raise your hand if you've ever encountered anything like that, please. Yep, that's uh, almost everybody. <laughs> okay. And I, yeah, I, I asked this question, I was asking this question even before the pandemic and people would raise their hands, but after the pandemic, then almost all almost all, everybody does because of course, you know, pandemic came out of nowhere. We weren't expecting that. And it just kind of, you know, uh, knocked us off our game. Um, yeah. And so you're going to encounter those things, but again, remember that you can turn them in the positives. And so I'm going to be telling you about some students who 
thought that they experienced uh, really significant stumbling blocks, but then they realized that those were just stepping stones. And so I'll tell you about that. And so what we're gonna talk about today is why college students might be inefficient learners. And then we'll talk about some metacognitive learning strategies that work and why they work. And uh, I was really very pleased to see that you're gonna be having some breakout sessions later uh, that will go more into detail with this. I wish I could attend the breakout sessions, but unfortunately I can't. Now I know these strategies work and how do I know they work? Because I wrote the book on it and I have the examples that will demonstrate to you that it works. And uh, this is Teach Yourself How to Learn. I wrote it with our younger daughter, who is an opera singer in Berlin, Germany. And uh, we write together because uh, she needs additional money. She also has a PhD in neuroscience from the University of Oxford. So she has, she has a few skills. Um, but we wrote this because we wanted students to have these uh, basic principles. And you heard that the... Uh, the strategies won a couple of awards. I was uh, given an award, a mentoring award in the Oval Office of the White House. And it's because of the impact of the strategies, the fact that the strategies enabled me to uh, help students, in this case, students uh, achieve their PhDs. And then most recently you heard that uh, I and my husband, this is my husband, he's a physicist, a physics professor, and we were named Louisiana Legends uh, by Louisiana Public Broadcasting. And my award was because of the impact that the learning strategies have had on students at all different levels. Now, I also want to point out that uh, the Unlocking College Learning that's being presented by SASE, um, you could not have a better uh, learning center on your campus. Uh, they are an award-winning center. Uh, they were designated a, uh, a center of excellence by National College Learning Center Association. And there are very few learning centers in the whole country that have this designation. And for almost 30 years, their tutors have been certified by the College Reading and Learning Association. And so let me just ask, how many of you have used some of the SASE services uh, up to this point? Raise your hand if you've used any of the SASE services. Uh, quite a few. Oh, okay, great. That's fantastic. And if you haven't, I'm going to strongly recommend that you do because folks at SASE know all this stuff that I'm talking about this, uh, this morning and more. And uh, I watch the videos. I strongly encourage you to look at the videos that tutors made about what to expect in the tutorial center, how to prepare for visits. It's just fantastic. And so I really strongly encourage you to, to use that. And so I do have some outcomes that I'd like for us to get uh, from our short time together this morning. And, and one is, I want you to analyze your current learning strategies. What are you doing to learn? And I want you to understand exactly what changes, if you may need to make any changes at all, that you might need to really maximize your learning and ACE courses and do it more efficiently. So even if you're doing great, hopefully these strategies will help you operate a little bit more efficiently so you have time for the rest of your life and enjoying things outside of a class. I want you to have very concrete strategies that you can use during the remainder of your time in college and beyond. And I want you to become a more efficient learner by studying smarter, not necessarily harder. And I want you to have more fun in your, your courses because I do know that if you, at least this has been my personal experience, that if I was in a course that seemed to be really, really difficult and I wasn't really sure that I was gonna excel, then that was a little bit stressful. And so I couldn't have as much fun in those courses as I could in courses where I knew that I had great strategies I was going to do well. I was going to learn the information. And so once you have these strategies, you can apply these to all of your courses and have lots of fun. And so we already defined metacognition. Uh, and it's just a term that was coined by a cognitive scientist, uh, Flavel, back in 1976. And simply put, as we said earlier, it's your ability to think about your own thinking. It's your ability to be consciously aware that you are a problem solver. So that when things come up that you might not know the answer to or might not have information about, you realize that you have the ability to get information about that. And so I'm gonna give you an example of that. And that example, uh, 
actually comes from my experience with a, a group of students at LSU. There was one group of students that I spoke to twice. And the second time I spoke to the group, I asked them, uh, what was the most useful strategy they learned from the first session? And well, several of them said what I'm going to share with you now, which is an example of how our metacognitive brain works. And so um, I, when I uh, want you to think about, I said, you know, ability to be consciously aware that you are a problem solver and you can come up with solutions to problems that you might not have thought you could have. And so I'm going to ask you to think about a problem and I'm going to ask you to raise your hand if you have this problem, because a lot of people have it. Now, how many of us have a problem with procrastination. Raise your hand if you have a problem with procrastination. And I had, I'd have both hands raised. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. So pretty much everybody? Pretty much everybody. Okay. And so if you are not using your metacognitive brain, you say, oh, okay, I'm a procrastinator. I, I put things off. I wish I didn't procrastinate so much, but I'm just a procrastinator. You know, that's what I do. And then the metacognitive brain says, yes, you are a procrastinator and we need to solve that problem because that's a real problem. And then your brain says, well, you know, what's the big deal? I'm a procrastinator. I do my best work at the last minute. And the metacognitive brain says, no, you don't. It says, you know that procrastination gets us into all kinds of trouble. And you say, like what? And so I'm going to ask you, and Dr. Frazier, you're going to have to recognize individual people here, but I want you to tell me what are some of the negative consequences of procrastination? And so if you have uh, an idea, any negative consequence of procrastination, just raise your hand. Um, anxiety. Absolutely. Anxiety. Yes. Anxiety. And for me, it's, it's stressful. Uh, the longer I put things off, the more stressed I am, the more stressed I am, the longer I put it off. Exactly. Yes. What's another Anything thing else? Less than your best work. Absolutely. Less than your best work. And actually, Dr. Frazier, I see that you're running the mic around and that's OK. But instead, if you just have the student, you just yell out the answer and then you repeat it, that probably is going to take a little bit uh, less time. But thanks so much. But yes, sure. less, less than your best work. And, and that's a biggie, because if you graduate from the University of New England with a GPA that is less than your ability, but it more reflects your the fact that you procrastinated, that's going to have all kinds of negative implications in terms of getting a job, getting into graduate school, getting into professional school, getting fellowships, all kinds of things. Yes. And so you don't want to do uh, less than your best work. And I'll take one more. So we're talking about the negative consequences of procrastination. Yep. Raise your hand. Yes. Hmm. Oh, go ahead. Yes. Go ahead. You can miss out on an opportunity. You absolutely, you miss out on, on an opportunity. You, in fact, you might oversleep after you put things off and then you stay up the, all night the night before. In fact, I know people who've actually missed tests because they procrastinated, they stayed up all night to study, and then they overslept and missed the test. So absolutely. Okay, and so the, the uh, metacognitive brain makes you think about all these negative consequences. And though your brain says, okay, 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 I get it. It's a problem. And so the metacognitive brain says, yes, we got to solve that problem. And then your brain says, well, I don't know how to solve procrastination. What am I supposed to do? And the metacognitive brain says, well, yeah, I do understand that you don't know how to solve procrastination, um, but you can, you can get information on this because there's a lot of stuff that you didn't know anything about, but if you wanted to know something about it, then you found out about it. And so I'm going to ask you if there's something, let's say you hear a new term and you don't know what it means and you want to find out what it means, what would you do to find out, uh, get information that about something that you didn't know about? And you can just yell that out as a group. What, what, what would you do? Google it. Google it, exactly. And so the metacognitive brain says, well, you Google everything else, so Google that. And if you were to Google how to avoid procrastination, you're going to be taken to all kinds of wonderful sites. Um, and I only know this because I was procrastinating. Uh, once I was procrastinating writing a paper, I'd spoken at a conference and we had to submit papers to go into the proceedings. And I just kept putting this thing off. And my metacognitive brain told me, you teach this stuff, so use it. 
And so it's like, okay. So I Googled how to avoid procrastination. It was taken to some great sites. And I, um, I found this one strategy that I still use to this day. This particular site said, it's easy to uh, solve procrastination. Um, you just have to tackle the hardest thing about doing something that you really don't feel like doing. So let me just ask, and you can yell this out. What is the hardest part, the hardest thing about doing something that you really don't feel like doing? Getting started. Exactly. Yes. Getting started. And so what this thing says is just use the tool that everybody carries around with them now. Everybody has a smartphone. And uh, what you do is you take out your cell phone and you decide how long you want to work on this. And I decided I wanted to uh, work on the paper for 45 minutes. So I set my timer for 45 minutes and it said, and commit to yourself when you hit start, you're going to start this thing and you're not going to stop until the timer goes off. And so I said, okay, well, I can do that. And then set a goal for what you want to accomplish during that time period. And all I wanted to do was get the, intro the outline and the introduction written. But by the time the timer went off, I had done the outline, the introduction, and the whole first section. Because you have you noticed that once you get started, things tend to go a little bit more quickly than you think they would go. Uh, raise your hand if you've noticed that, if that's the case with you, that once you do get started, then things kind of move uh, a little bit faster than you thought. Yeah, we, we, we've noticed. Okay, great. And so I want you to use that strategy the next time you find yourself procrastinating. It's your ability to monitor your mental processing and then plan how you're going to improve and then control what you're doing. So you know if you're understanding material or just memorizing it. It's your ability to accurately judge your level of learning so that you know that you're studying at the appropriate level. Okay, so here's a question. Raise your hand if this is the case. Uh, have you heard any professors at University of New England say something like, you're at the university now. You've got to kick it up a notch. This is not high school anymore. We operate at higher levels at the university. Raise your hand if you've heard a professor say anything that's kind of similar to that. A few. Oh, oh, okay. So not that many. Usually we as faculty say that all the time. Um, and so, uh, but, but it's true. You've got to kick it up a notch, uh, which is really what this whole conference is about. And uh, when we look at uh, kicking it up a notch, many times I'll ask students, um, you know, what that means uh, to kick it up a notch. And sometimes they'll say, oh, well, they, the professors mean that college is harder than high school. We're going to have more work. We've got to take more responsibility for our own learning. And all of that stuff is true, but they're also talking about something that's called Bloom's taxonomy, B as in boy, L-O-O-M-S, Bloom's taxonomy. So raise your hand, please, if you would say you're very familiar with Bloom's taxonomy. That, that would be nobody. Nobody. Okay. So we're going to uh, talk about blooms because that knowing what the levels are is going to help you kick your uh, activities, your studying up to a higher level. And it's your ability to know what you know and what you don't know. So you don't go into a test or a quiz thinking, okay, I know this stuff. I'm good. I studied it. And then you get there and you look at the first two items. It's like, uh oh, I guess I don't really know this. And so I'm going to share some very specific strategies uh, at, by way of introducing you to two students. And the first student is Dana. She was a first year student in physics. And I actually met her when she was about to drop out of physics as a major. She'd always wanted to be a medical physicist since she was 10th grade, and she was a straight-A student in high school. So when she made the 80 on the first test, she was concerned, um, but she was going to stay in physics. But then when she made the 54, she decided that physics was not for her. She was going to have to find something else and drop out. So I drop out of physics and change her major. So I met her at a change your major workshop. And, uh, and you'll hear in her own voice exactly what her experience was. Um, and her problem was that she, before we talked, she was memorizing formulas and uh, using a homework, uh, online homework aid. Uh, but then you'll hear what she did after as we hear her. So I'm going to now uh, play her. And Dr. Frazier, uh, just give me a yes or no. Let me know if you can hear her. Let me turn the volume all the way up. And for the students, let me just say that she starts off uh, kind of softly. And so you have to pay very close attention, but she does get louder. So Dr. Frazier, just let me know if you can understand what she's saying. 
Okay, thank you. Hi, my name is Dana Lewis Derby, and I am a former student of Dr. McGuire's, and she asked for me to share a little bit of my story with you today. Um, so I met Dr. McGee um, at a Find Your Major workshop at LSU when I was a freshman. I knew that I wanted to major in physics when I started college, but I quickly found myself failing my introduction to physics class. So I freaked out and thought, you know what, maybe I'm not cut out for this and decided to attend that workshop. When I went there, I shared my story and afterwards Dr. McGuire approached me and asked me if I would consider sticking with physics a little while longer and maybe trying to approach my assignments and my tests uh, in a little bit of a different way. So instead of changing my major, I did. I stayed with physics. Her and I began working together and she began teaching me some of her strategies revolving around metacognition. I quickly learned that my method of trying to memorize material in order to pass assignments and tests just was not going to cut it. Um, I had to really learn the ability to problem solve and I essentially had to relearn how to study. I was reading chapters differently, making notes, and essentially completing homework assignments like I had to teach the material to someone else. With the thought behind that being, if you can teach it, uh, then you really do know what you're talking about. After working with Dr. McGuire for a full semester, um, I ended up making an A in my physics course, and I went on to graduate with uh, my bachelor's in physics from LSU with honors, all with Dr. McGuire's help. Um, so I didn't quite know that going to one workshop was gonna be so instrumental in setting me up for success throughout my entire college career. My life would be very, very different if I had not met uh, Dr. McGuire that day and implemented the strategies that she taught me. Um, she is absolutely phenomenal and she really does have the golden ticket of information that's going to push you towards optimal success. So I hope that you um, enjoy the workshop today. Thanks for listening and best of luck. Bye. Yes, and I asked Dana to uh, to share that with other um, students uh, because I did want you to know how effective the strategies can be. Now, there are a couple of things that she said that are a little bit misleading. Uh, one, she said, well, one is a lot misleading. She said that I'm phenomenal. And it's not me that's phenomenal. It's the strategies that are phenomenal. And then she said that we worked together for the whole semester as I was teaching her strategies. Now, we did work together for the whole semester because I became her mentor, but I only shared the learning strategies with her in one session, like the session that we're having uh, today. And so I wanted to go then a little bit more in detail about uh, what changed Dana's life. And actually, I found out when I taught at Cornell University, I found that the number one reason that my chemistry students in general chemistry, organic chemistry, were making C's, D's, and lower rather than the A's that they could have been making was because of the way they did their homework. And so we're going to talk about a homework strategy. Um, but before I get into the first step of it, I want to ask you to think about, you know, when you've been doing homework, and if you've ever done this, raise your hand. If you've ever looked at a homework problem or a question that you have to answer, if, and you've flipped back in the chapter to find an example of the problem you have to work or a discussion of the question you have to answer, then please raise your hand if you've ever done that. That's pretty much everybody. <laughs> okay, and I should have both hands up because I certainly did that. Okay, now I've got to ask you, um, when we did that, when we worked the problem or answered the question that way, was it our brain that was actually doing the work? Just yell out yes or no. Was our brain actually doing the work? No. No. Um, but something was doing the work because we turned the homework in, we got, you know, a perfect score possibly on the homework, a really high grade. So if our brain wasn't doing the work, what was doing the work? In the textbook. Exactly. Yes, the textbook, the author, the example. And because you are really, really bright students, like I was a great student, do you remember thinking when you looked at the way the example was worked or discussion thinking, oh, yeah, I understand that. 
oh yeah, I got that. But then when we got to the test or quiz, if they changed anything at all around, what happened? It's like, oops, I don't really have that. And so this homework strategy actually will address that. And so to prevent that from happening, before you look at the first problem or question, we got to study the information. And as you're studying the information, whether you're using your notes or your textbook, you're going to come across examples. And I'm going to ask you to tell me, and you can just yell this out, um, it, what do you do now if you are using your textbook or if you're using your notes what do you do when you get to an example and i can tell you i can take it i'm not going to hear from you anything i haven't heard from students all over the country so be perfectly honest what do you do when you get to an example or those little thought questions about you know what do you why do you think this happened what do you do yeah so we we've heard they skip them Okay, <laughs> yes. Um, and, and I know not everybody is skipping them, but most people probably are. And that surprised me because I didn't know people were skipping the examples because I didn't skip the examples. I didn't use it the right way, but I would at least read the problem and, and see what the author did. But most people are skipping it. And so you got to commit to yourself that from now on, you will never skip another example. Because after you've studied the information, the examples are your brain's best resource for convincing itself that it can work these problems without the aid of the author. And we're going to use the examples as a way to develop that skill. And so when you get to an example, uh, since you've studied the information, just read the problem statement and work it yourself. Uh, start working it. And uh, even if you get stuck, you don't know exactly what to do next, just power your way through until you get to an answer. And then compare just the answer with the answer that's in the book. If you got the same answer, then you can look at what the author did. And if it's a question that you're answering, then write out your answer to the question and then compare what you've written to the discussion in the book. And so if it's a problem, if you got the same answer, that's fine. You can look at what the author did. But if you didn't get the same answer, don't look yet try to figure out where your mistake was. And so now just yell out as a group, um, it, at this point in the process, do you think making a mistake is good or bad? Good. Good, okay, it's so fascinating because students always say making a mistake is good, but whenever I ask faculty what they think students say, faculty always say students say bad, but students always say good, and you're absolutely right. Making a mistake at this point is a good thing. Now, don't get me wrong though. I'm not saying that it's bad if you don't make a mistake at this point. It's fantastic if you don't make a mistake at this point, but why is it good if you make a mistake at this point? So raise your hand if you want to answer that question and Dr. Frazier will tell us. Anybody? Yes. You learn from it. Exactly. Yeah. I get three common responses from students. And that's the first one. They'll say, well, you learn from your mistakes. Absolutely. Um, and, and there are two other common things that I hear. Anybody have any yes, other? I know. You, you can see your process to the solution, not just the right answer. Exactly. And so sometimes people say that as they'll say, well, now I can figure out during the process where my brain went wrong. And once I know where my brain went wrong, then I can correct that. Absolutely. And I'll take one more response. If somebody else. Yes. You don't do that on the test. Exactly. Yes. Did you look at my notes? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> yeah, those are the three. And, and I, I want to say a little bit more about that last one, um, that it's not the test. Um, and let me ask, raise your hand if this has ever happened to you. you. You got a test or a quiz back and you didn't do as well as you thought, but then you looked at it and you saw that you made simple mistakes. And you said, oh, I made so many simple mistakes. I didn't do as well because of simple mistakes. Raise your hand if that's ever happened, where you get it back. Okay, and I yeah. can see almost everybody, yes. Well, you know, I used to think the same thing. But my attitude now is there's really no such thing as just simple mistakes. Mistakes only look simple in retrospect. Once you know what the right thing is, your mistake looks so simple. But mistakes are things that have to be made. And either you're going to make them during this process or where are you going to make them? Yell it out. 
On the test. On the test, exactly. And so you got to get the mistakes out of your system doing this process so that you don't make them on the test. So let me let the PowerPoint catch up. Check to see if it's correct. If it's not, figure out where your mistake was made. And that's just the example. So then when you get to the actual homework problems, then try to do two or three or answer two or three questions and speed it up a little bit. Because so many students run out of time on a test or a quiz, not because they don't know the information, but because they have never practiced doing things a little bit more quickly, speeding up the process. And so if you do this when you're doing your homework, then it makes a huge difference. And this is exactly what uh, Dana did when she changed it and she started doing homework as if she had to teach it, uh, et cetera. Now, I am not asking uh, about you. I'm just asking about your friends. So do you have any friends who are using the resource um, Chegg. So again, do you know anybody who's using Chegg? Not you necessarily, but any friends? Raise your hand if you have friends who use Chegg. Just, just a couple. Just a couple, okay. <laughs> well, that can definitely be a culprit because Chegg provides these solutions. And so it prevents people from going through the process that we just talked about. Now, if you want to use Chegg, you know, after you've gone through this process just to check, then that's okay. But it really, it, it can be a culprit. And with students at LSU, once they stopped using Chegg, then they saw their scores really significantly rise because now their brain was doing the work as opposed to Chegg. Now, 95% of Chegg customers say they get better grades. Well, I guess they do because Chegg is doing the homework for them. And uh, if you get really high homework uh, grades, even if your test scores are a little bit lower, you can still end up with a better grade. So tell those friends who you know who are using Chegg to, um, to cut the Chegg. Now, the next strategy that I want to share with you is uh, a reading strategy. And I was excited to hear uh, that you're going to have a, a reading workshop after. And I've looked at uh, some of uh, Dr. Drone's material, and it is fantastic. So uh, I really wish I could attend that workshop. So this is going to be kind of a quick and dirty um, reading um, strategy, and he's going to go into much more detail. But this was a, a student, Travis, who was in psychology, and he'd made a 47 and a 52 on the first two tests. And I talked with him the night before the third test for about 30 minutes. He made an 82. And he was so excited, and he called me and said, Dr. McGuire, I made an 82 on that test. And I said, wow, Travis, that's fantastic, because I really thought that he was going to make maybe like in the low to mid 70s. I figured 20 point bump 30 minutes the night before was all I was expecting. But he made an 82. So excited. And so I said, great, Travis, if you make higher than an 85 on your next test, I will take you to lunch. And so he calls me back about three weeks later and he made an 86. So I took him to lunch and I said, Travis, what are you doing? He said, I'm just doing that stuff you told me to do. And with Travis, it was a reading strategy. And now I've got to, I want you to think about when you read, and I'm going to ask you if you've ever had this experience, raise your hand. Have you ever had the experience where you start to read, you read a little bit, and then your mind starts to wander? Does that ever happen to anybody? Raise your hand if that happens. Mm, yeah. Okay. Yep, <laughs> yeah. Everybody. Okay. And so now when that happens, and if you're like me, I don't even realize that I'm not paying attention until I get maybe two or three paragraphs down the road. And then I realize ah, I wasn't paying attention to this stuff. And what do you tend to do once you realize that you weren't paying attention? So you've missed like the last couple of paragraphs or so. What do you do at that point? You can just yell it out. Go back over it. Exactly. Go back and reread. And you might get a little bit further, but you're not going to get a lot further because you don't have any different strategies. Well, this strategy will address that. Um, one of the things that I learned, I went to a reading workshop because there were so many students at LSU uh, at, coming to our learning center, asking us for reading strategies. And I taught chemistry, so I didn't know how to teach people how to read. So I went to this workshop and I learned that the main reason that we don't get a lot out of our reading is because of this mind wandering. But the way to prevent that is if before you start to read, you give your brain an overview of what it's about to read. Because we know from the cognitive science literature that whenever the brain is trying to learn something new, if it has a big picture, an overview, and then it gets individual details to put inside that big picture, it's much more efficient than if it starts out 
getting the individual details, trying to create its own big picture. And so do that survey, look at the summary, the bold face print, any italicized words, and then come up with questions that you want the reading to answer for you. So for example, if I were reading a, um, a chapter on acids and bases in chemistry, I would see strong acid, weak acid, strong base, weak base uh, in bold face print. So now my brain knows that's what it's going to be reading about. And um, I might say, well, I wonder what the, the difference is. What is this thing the book going to say is the difference between strong acids and weak acids. Does one of them burn you more than another? I don't know. Let me see what the reading says. And so then when you have your questions and you start to read, just read the first paragraph. And after you've read that, stop and put that information in your own words. And then read the second paragraph, stop, put that information in your own words and try to fold in what was in the first paragraph and then read subsequent paragraphs the same way. Now, I got to stop and ask you this. Uh, does it raise your hand if you think it sounds like if I got to do all that, it's going to take a long time to finish the reading. Does that process sound like it's going to take longer? Yeah. Okay, yes, but it doesn't. It sounds like it would take longer, but students, the students I've taught, and I've taught this uh, process to undergraduate students, graduate school students, law school students, med school students, dental school students, divinity school students, high school students, and uh, they love it. And uh, they would come back to the office and say, Dr. McGuire, that reading strategy is fantastic. I'm getting so much more out of my reading now. And I'd say, that's, that's great. Are you finding that it's taking you longer to get through the reading using this than what you were doing before? And to a person, they say, well, actually, no, I finished the reading sooner using this than what I was doing before. So my question to you is, why do you think it would take less time to finish the reading, doing everything that we we're just talking about than what people were doing before. And I'll take a couple of responses if we have a couple of people who want to weigh in on that question. Shout it out, anybody, yes. You don't have to keep rereading. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And less distractions. Okay, I tell you, I think you guys could have given this presentation because everything I'm about <laughs> to tell you, you're telling me, yeah. And those are the main two reasons that students say, they said, you don't have to do the rereading. And you're right, because with the old way, you would read a little bit, but then you have to go back, read, go back, read, go back, read, go back, read, go back. With the new way, you actually are moving more slowly through the material, but you get to the end point sooner because you're not doing all that back and forth. And the other thing they say is you're more focused which is what you said, less distractions, um, because now you have the questions that are guiding you in your reading and it makes a big difference. And then uh, recite, and it's called SQ5R, come up with the survey questions and then read while you're reciting. And you can annotate in the margin, you can make notes if you, uh, there are certain uh, principles or certain key terms in each paragraph, you can uh, annotate that. And then the next R is for review. Once you get to the end of a section, then stop and review what you've just learned. And then the last R is for reflect. Are there any other views? Are there any other ways of thinking about this? So for example, if you were in a community nutrition course, let's say, and the textbook told you to tell all of your clients to eat a diet that is very rich in fresh fruits and vegetables. Well, that's fine, but what if you know that your clients live in a food desert, so they don't have access to fresh fruits and vegetables? What can you tell them that's gonna be useful um, that, because you can't tell them to do what the book tells you to do. And so then just reflecting, do, I, do you have any other remaining questions? Uh, are there things that if you were in a conversation with the author, that you would ask the author to clarify that you didn't see in the book? And so when you do this, you get a lot out of your reading. And so I'm going to do a little exercise with you now to show you exactly how this works. Uh, there's a different exercise in the book. Uh, so if, if those of you, if you've read the book, this is going to be a different exercise. And so um, let me take it off now. But I'm going to put this passage on the screen. I'm going to give you a minute or so to read it. Then I'm going to take it off and ask you a question. So let's read this.
Okay, you might not have read the whole thing, but I'm gonna, uh, I think you've read enough. So I'm gonna take it off the screen and ask if, um, please raise your hand if you think that if I asked you to stand up and summarize the information in that passage to the group, if you think you'd be able to provide a summary of what was on that uh, slide to the group, raise your hand, please. Do we have any takers? No, no. Okay. And I certainly was not able to do it. But let me ask you this. If you had known before you started to read that this was about flying a kite, uh, would that have made a difference? And so I want you to read it again. And then just raise your hand if it makes more sense to you now that you know what it's about. And if you think you would be in a better position to summarize it to the group. Does it make more sense now? Raise your hand if it makes more sense to you now. Yes. Okay, yes. wonderful, yes. And see, and that's the beauty of just taking that few minutes before you start to read to do the preview, because now you have a context for all the little details. You, you know what that big picture is, and that makes a big difference. And here's the reference for that. And here's a web link to, to that information. And so it is really, really important that we use strategies. And so for the next couple of minutes, I want us to, uh, to think about a couple of reflection questions, because I said one of my main goals was to see if we could discover the gap between what we have been doing and what we need to be doing in college to um, really have a deep understanding and ace those courses. And so I wanted to, to think about What's the difference? What would you say is the difference between studying and learning? What's the difference between studying and learning? And um, so I'm going to ask for maybe a couple of people to share their thoughts on that. And again, there are no right or wrong answers to any of this. Any thoughts? Okay, Dean Kirsten. I think studying is to know and learning is to use. Interesting. Okay, studying is to know and learning is to use. Okay. Um, and this is this is Dean. This is not a student, correct? That's right. <laughs> okay, yes. It's very interesting because uh, Dean, your response, uh, I've not heard that from a student, but it makes perfect sense to me. But <laughs> I've, I've not heard that from a student. And so I need at least two students. I know you have ideas. This is the University of New England. You've got ideas. Yes, So shout it out. You learn first and study it second. Interesting. Okay. And I have gotten that response quite often. Okay. Yeah. Learn first and study second. Okay. And I need one more response because I still haven't heard the most common response I hear from students. Okay. Studying, um, it's going over the material first and then learning would be having it not memorized, like with in quotes for lack of better terms. Interesting. Okay, yes. And so you did use that word that most students use. Um, the most common answer I get from students is they'll say well, that studying is just memorizing information for a test or a quiz. But learning is when you understand that information, you can apply it, you can relate it to something you already know. Sometimes they'll say studying is short term, learning is long term. And sometimes they will say that learning comes first and then studying. And so let me just ask, if you say learning comes first and then studying, where did the learning occur that, when did you learn what you're gonna be studying later? And you can just yell it out, anybody. When would you have learned it? In class. In class, yes. And so I often get that answer and I understand that answer, but for me, I like to make a distinction between learning about something and learning something. Because I think in class, we learn about things and because we have great professors that explain things really, really well, 
you know, it's very easy for us to leave that setting thinking that we've learned it when we really actually only learned about it. And it's only when we go back later and apply the learning strategies that we now um, understand it well enough that we can apply it, we can answer questions we hadn't seen before, uh, et cetera. And so, but I understand that because I used to think that I had learned stuff in class. And when I studied it, I just needed to go over what I'd already learned in class. But because I was thinking that, when do you think I started studying for tests? You can yell that out. When would I start studying for my exams? Or when do most uh, students start studying for tests? A couple of days before. Okay. Oh, and you guys are, are twice as good as most people. Because for most of us, it was the night before. Yeah. But even a couple of days before. Because uh, I thought I'd learned it. And so I didn't want to start studying too soon because I didn't want to forget it. And so I would start studying the night before. Um, but of course, you know, that was that was a fallacy. So I, I do want to make sure, though, that that we think of learning as not something that happens in class necessarily, that we're learning about it, and then we go back and spend time on it, then that's when we're actually going to understand it to the level that we can um, can, can really use the information. And um, studying is knowing, learning is doing. When you um, get into the profession, I think it, you know, it has a little bit different spin on it. But if we take studying to be memorizing information for a test or a quiz and learning, making sure you totally understand that, you could explain any concept to, uh, to anyone else. Uh, at this point, and I'll ask you to do this by a show of hands, um, how many of you would say that up to this point, you've been more in study mode than in learn mode? Please raise your hand if that's the case. Mm, most, but not okay. all. Okay, yes, and, and some of us are in learn mode. I was definitely in study mode. Okay, and then the next question that I want to ask is I'm gonna ask you, uh, if which task would you work harder for? If I told you that you had to make an A on the next test that's coming up, or if I told you that we are gonna have a review session, the class period before the next test, and you are gonna teach that review session. So I'm gonna have you come up to the front of the class explain all of the concepts, paying particular attention to the more difficult concepts to make sure everybody's prepared for the test the next day, would you work harder for A or B? So just yell that out and uh, tell me what you're hearing more of, A or B. Oh, uh, there, there's uh, some of both, but it sounded more like B. Oh, interesting, okay. Uh, so let's do this by a show of hands. Uh, if you'd work harder for A, raise your hand. Okay, and if you'd work harder for B, raise your hand. Okay, is there a majority either way? Slightly more B than A. Got you, okay. And again, there are no right or wrong answers. So I, what I find is that typically the people who work harder to make an A on the test are usually doing the right thing. They are saying, if I've got to make an A on the test, I'm going to you know, really make sure that I understand everything totally. Uh, whereas if I'm teaching the material, then I might decide to skip some stuff. Um, but since most people said B, let me just ask a couple of people who said B to explain why you would work harder if you had to teach the material. Why would you work harder to teach material? Anybody? Anybody? Yes. I feel like on a I feel like on a test you know what's going to be on a test rather than the class you have to teach the entire thing like all of the material. Okay, yes, and that's one of the the answers I get. What she's saying is that if you're trying to make an A on the test, then you kind of know what the test is going to cover, and so you can confine yourself to studying those topics. But if you've got to teach the material, then you got to do everything. Thanks for sharing that. And I'll give you the other two in the interest of time. I say our time is flying by here. Um, but uh, one of the things that students say is they say, well, I got to really know it if I have to teach it. And then some students say, well, I don't want to be embarrassed in front of the class. I don't want to look stupid in front of the class. And so I want to make sure that I'm anticipating questions. I can answer questions that come up. Sometimes I say, I want to be able to explain everything more than one way. 
because sometimes there are students who, if I explain it one way, they may not, not understand it. So I need to be able to say it a different way. And then uh, there are these very empathetic students who say, well, I want to make sure that I explain it well enough so that everybody gets it. Because if I do a bad job explaining and people don't do well on the test, then I'm not going to have any friends after that. And um, and so they re that's why they would work harder. Now, let me ask um, for this one. Uh, up to this point in time, would you say, uh, well, if you've been more in A mode where you've been studying to make A's on tests instead of preparing to teach the material, raise your hand if up to this point you've been more in scenario A mode. Yep, looks like uh, more in scenario A. Uh, yes, and I know I definitely was. And so now I want you to get in the mode of uh, teaching the material. And, you know, um, if you have any empty chairs in your room, if you have stuffed animals, if you have imaginary friends, if you have any audience, either real or imagined, that you can pretend you're teaching it to, it works because when you're trying to explain something, if you don't really understand it, then your brain is going to get stuck. And then that's your key to go back and study it more. So basically the ACE courses and everything else, we got to stay in learn mode and we've got to work as if we have to teach the material, not just make an A on the test. And so I wanted to tell you about Ty, who was a student who heard about this process. And he came up and he told me that he had a beta fish in his room and uh, he was going to teach the material to his beta fish. He wasn't doing well in biology or chemistry. And then a few weeks later, he uh, sent me an email and he said his bio exam had gone from 66 to 98 and his chem had gone from 62 to 83. And then I got his third exam score in biology. I didn't get the rest of his scores in chem, but he ended up with a B in both courses. And this is the email that he sent me to explain what he did differently. So he started going to more of the review sessions, the uh, SI sessions. Uh, these are peer-led um, review learning strategy session. And before he heard this information, he wouldn't do anything before he went to those sessions. But after he heard this information, now he uh, tried to work on his own before he went. And so he would try to answer as many of the questions as possible to see where he was in terms of what he understood and what he really needed to focus on. And then after those sessions, he would go back to his room and teach the materials to his beta fish. And anything he couldn't explain, he would study more. And then he just continued that cycle until he could explain everything in his notes. And it was very interesting because when I looked at the videos that the tutors have made for you for the Sassy Center, this is so consistent. They, they talked about how to best prepare for a session with a tutor by looking at what you understand, come with questions that they can address. And then they talk about what to do after the session so that you review that information. And so uh, that's very helpful. And there's the beta fish again. And, um, and so now I want to do a little exercise with you that shows you why I am confident. I tell students all the time, you know, I don't care if you made a 40 on the first test. I know you can make 80, 90 higher on the next test because your performance had nothing to do with how smart you are. It had everything to do with the strategies you've used, and we can change the strategies. And so on the next slide, uh, after this one, the one after this one, you're going to see a whole bunch of numbers all jumbled up. And I want you to first locate the number one, and then in sequential order, next find the number two, then find the number three. And I'm going to give you 15 seconds to do it. And when 15 seconds are up, I'm going to take them off the screen. And I want you to just hold up your fingers and uh, tell us how many uh, you saw. So start finding the numbers now. and stop. Okay, so um, raise your fingers. And if you need more than um, two hands, then just yell it out, I guess. Uh, but what kind of numbers are we seeing? We're seeing everywhere from two or three to 10. Eight, nine. Okay, great. Yeah, and that's typically what happens. It's usually uh, single digits or low double digits. And so now I want you to look at them again with this vertical line and this horizontal line and the position of the number one. 
And so now I want you to, uh, you know, kind of find them in sequential order. And you'll notice that they are arranged according to something. And so when you see what they're arranged according to, then just yell that out. Anybody yeah. see it yet? The the numbers go in order in the from grid to grid. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Clock, clockwise or in quadrants. Uh, many times students say, yeah, so the one is here, the two is there, the three, the four is in this quadrant, five, six, et cetera. And so now what I'm going to do is give you 15 seconds to find as many as you can find. And so let's start finding the numbers now. and stop. Okay, did you do better that time? Okay, yes. and yeah, most people tend to get um, twice the, uh, as many the second time as the first time. And so the reason we could do so much better, there were two major differences between the first and second attempt. Um, what was uh, one of the differences? If you, have an, if you wanna explain, why did we do so much better the second time around? What was the difference? You weren't so scatterbrained. And others? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Right. The the it was a smaller grid to look for the number instead of the whole exactly um, screen. Yes. Yes. And that's what I interpreted the scatterbrain to mean. Also, that you didn't have to look all over the screen. You could focus on a smaller amount uh, of smaller space, and that's really important. That's why it's so crucial to not wait until the night before when you had everything you have to study, but to study as you go along. So you're focusing on smaller bits of information. And, and we knew how the information was organized. We knew exactly where to look. Absolutely. And so um, basically then what we're saying is that you can turn yourself into an efficient expert learner by doing think aloud exercises, constantly asking yourself why, how, and what if questions, always testing your understanding by verbalizing or writing about concepts. This is called practicing retrieving the information, retrieval information, and then moving your activities higher on Bloom's taxonomy, which I talked about earlier. And so Bloom's taxonomy is just hierarchy of learning levels where it starts with just straight memorization, goes up to understanding where now you can explain any concept uh, to your 80-year-old grandmother or your eight-year-old nephew in words they understand. And then applying, you can use the information to answer questions, solve problems you've never seen before. At analyzing, you can take any concept, break it into simpler concepts and see how they all fit together. Evaluating, you can look at any two ideas, two theories, uh, two processes, uh, two ways of doing things and determine whether one is more likely to be better than another. And then that creating, you can come up with your own ideas, your own ways of doing things. And so I want you to think back to high school and I want you to raise your hand now, your fingers, one, two, three, four, five, six, and tell me what level of blooms did you have to operate to make A's and B's in high school, would you say? And I know it's gonna be a variety, but, um, yeah, just raise your hand. Yep, and we see I see some ones, some twos, okay. threes. We have one four, one five, more okay. three twos. And are you seeing more? Um, what would you say you're seeing more of? The twos and threes. Got you, twos and threes. Yes. Okay. Now, if we look for at UNE, what do you think the lowest level you're going to have to operate to make the A's to learn to make the A's that you're totally capable of making? And so raise your fingers for that. And what are you seeing? Five, six. Okay, absolutely. Yep. And I'm going to say it's six. If you've got any term papers or research projects, uh, the level of creativity that goes into those is really important. And so now we see the third piece of the puzzle. People are not doing as well, not because they couldn't do well, but they were in study mode, not learn mode. They were working to make A's on tests instead of preparing to teach the material. And now we see that they were at lower levels of blooms. Well, how do you move yourself to higher levels? We say, use the study cycle. This five-step process um, preview before you go to class. So you set your brain up for learning, then go to class and then review right after class. 
and then conduct these focus study sessions where we show you how to organize. Um, let's say if you're going to study for an hour, set a goal for a minute or two, then study with focus and action, then take a break, come back and review. And you can do much shorter sessions. Sometimes students say, well, I have ADHD. I can't study for 60 minutes. And that's okay. You can do a 10-minute session. You can do an eight-minute session. Set a goal for you know, 30 minutes, study for eight minutes. You don't need to take a break then, uh, but then review. And you just have to do more of them if you do shorter sessions. But um, this is a great tool for doing that. And this one, young lady um, said uh, that it helped her most. She got an A plus on three out of four of her finals using that method. She said it's really beneficial for students before, but it's very beneficial during finals week because it's more, it's kind of a time management tool also. And she's about to finish up her PhD and start her postdoc work. And so in the next minute, I just want to say a little bit about mindset. And that has to do with our view of intelligence. Uh, whether we think that we are born with a certain amount of intelligence, it's not going to change very much, or we recognize that we can grow our intelligence with our actions by using strategies. And this is the work of Carol Dweck, who's a cognitive psychologist at Stanford. And what she found was that people with a fixed mindset who think that you're born with a certain amount of intelligence uh, typically avoid challenges. They give up very easily. They see effort as fruitless because they think either they're smart enough or good enough to do stuff without putting in any work, or they're not good enough to do it at all. And so they don't put in any work. They ignore useful criticism and they feel threatened when others are successful. But students with a, or anybody with a growth mindset embraces challenges. Uh, they persist in the face of setbacks. They see effort as the path to mastery. And so they know that they can persist by putting in this effort and they learn from the criticism of uh, others and they are inspired by other success. And so as a result, these people reach higher levels of achievement, whereas these folks plateau very early and don't get any better at all. So it's really important to have that uh, that growth mindset. Uh, this is a student who had a very fixed mindset. He told me he wasn't good at chemistry. His grade was reflecting that. Um, I met with him for an hour, didn't teach him uh, any, I didn't tutor him at all, but I taught him the learning strategies that we've just talked about. And these were his grades before, these were his grades after. He ended up making an A in the course. He wasn't using the book before we talked, but then after we talked, he started using the book, making side notes in each chapter. And he recognized now that everything builds from the previous topic uh, in chemistry. And, and this is um, an excerpt of an interview that I did with a Princeton University student um, who had just graduated, but she struggled a lot her first year. And she was making B's and C's. She came from a public high school. And she and her friends had decided that, well, if you're from a public high school, then you're not going to make A's at Princeton. That's for the students who went to the exclusive private high schools. And um, But she said the mindset chapter in the book was so, so important to her because then she realized that now you have challenges you have to overcome, but you can do better. And she told me about um, when she was making a C in her first neuro class, but she wanted to do research with that professor. And she went and talked to the professor and the professor scoffed at her and said, well, why are you even trying to major in neuroscience? You're making a C in my class. What do you mean you wanna do research with me? And so she said she was devastated. She went home and she cried the rest of the afternoon. And she thought about, could she major in something else? And she said, no, I, she really wanted to do neuroscience. So she used the strategies and she ended up making all A's her senior year, taking nothing but neuro courses and she made an A plus on her senior thesis. And so she said, if it wasn't for the growth mindset, she wouldn't still be at Princeton. And she now knows that just because you're from a public high school or whatever your background is, that doesn't mean that you can't thrive at a prestigious institution like the University of New England. And so I've got about two more minutes, three more minutes, and then we're going to be out of here. But I just wanted to recap the effective metacognitive strategies you know, always solve problems without looking at an example or solution. Make sure you memorize everything you're told to, because that's the base of Bloom's taxonomy. Always ask those why, how, and what if questions. Test your understanding by pretending you're teaching. 
try to spend some time on every subject every day. So you keep it fresh in your mind, even if it's only about 20 minutes, use that study cycle with, oh, I should say focus study sessions. Uh, we used to call them intense study sessions, but our students uh, said they didn't like the word intense. So we changed it to focus. They said intense was too intense a word. And so we changed it to focus. Uh, go to tutoring sessions on a regular basis. Sassy has fantastic tutors. And then always aim for 100% mastery, not just 90%. So what can you do? You might need to spend more time studying. Aim for those higher learning levels. Use office hours and study groups productively. Use that study cycle. Uh, the basic thing is uh, use metacognition to study smarter. And so uh, you're not going to have a chance to do this now. But before you go to sleep, tonight, I want you, based on what we've done and what you're doing in the breakouts, decide on what behavior you might change, commit to changing for at least the next few weeks, because if you don't start it within the next 48 hours, you probably never will. And so now I want to go back to what we were talking about at the beginning, this uh, bumblebee who couldn't, uh, the aerodynamic scientists calculated that they shouldn't be able to fly. Well, as you may recall, I said this event happened in the 1930s, and aerodynamic science was in its infancy in the 1930s. And so the equations, the, the mathematical relationships were just being developed. And so the guy was using the mathematical relationships um, that were true with airplane wings, and he was using that for bumblebees. And the fact is, if bumblebee wings were like airplane wings, bumblebees would never get off the ground. But bumblebee wings and airplane wings are very different. Airplane wings are smooth and flat, and they don't move at all. But bumblebee wings have lots of bumps and these zigs and zags, and they are constantly flapping. And it's this constant flapping that creates the airfoil that allows the bumblebee to stay aloft. And so the bottom line is whenever you see a bumblebee in the future, let it remind you that if anybody tells you that you're not gonna be successful at something that you tell them that you are planning to do, tell them, check your assumptions. I am a University of New England Nor'easter and I have metacognitive strategies and I know I will succeed at whatever I try and then drop the mic, walk away and leave them in your blue nor'easter dust. So go nor'easters. And I will stop the share and uh, yes, and turn it back over to Dr. Frazier. So, and thank everybody. I really enjoyed uh, talking with you and uh, yes, thank Great. you. Thank you so much, Dr. McGuire.